Alright, we're live. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we're supposed to go on this phone. Um, <laughs> one of the two days. Uh, it's always exciting when the course launches and we get to meet all the students for the first time. 
we've seen their names, we've talked to them on the phone, we've emailed them, they've been on a little whiteboard in the office, uh, but it's, it's pretty exciting. And so a component of all of our courses is that a public presentation, and they share uh, the academic content that they learned along their journey, as well as um, you know some of the really juicy stuff in terms of you know how many days of headwind they had and um, that type of stuff that we're we're all about. So before we got uh, get started, um, since we do have a lot of family members here and uh, different people associated with the Wild Rockies Skills Institute. I thought uh, the audience members could go around and just introduce yourself, uh, let, let us know your affiliation to the organization, whether you're a, a board member, a former instructor, a, a parent of one of the students, and then we will turn it over to the instructors and the students to presentation. So, uh, board president, Brian. I'm Brian Osberg. Uh, I'm a board member of the board, I think this is my sixth year, and uh, last year, this year's uh, board chair, and I echo Carrie's comments. Uh, this is really exciting work. Thank you for the parents. I'm really interested in the uh, uh, A2. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your I'm Rosemary Johnson, and I'm the mom. <laughs> I'm Sven Taps. I uh, kind of lucked into this. Uh, I'm a database administrator at Fish Wildlife and Parks, and uh, my niece, of course, and, uh, generously got me involved in launch, <laughs> 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 I guess. And, and so on. It's, it's been a great experience. Sven and his wife generously posted the students while they were in Helena for three days. Yeah, <laughs> Gave them showers yeah, 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 yeah. and the camp, and they've still so, been talking about the breakfast. I'm going to summer. Uh, I like my, the course is only July, so uh, <laughs> I don't know what we can do. I'm Candace Horton, and I'm Corey Horton's mother, uh, and I live out on Bellevue, Washington. I'm Katie, I'm Corey Stone. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, hey, hey. I am the administrative assistant at Worthy. I've been here for almost two years now. Hi, I'm Molly Yam. Um, I was a Worthy student in 2004, and then I uh, was a instructor on this spring. Let's see. We'll pop over to you, Mary. I'm Mary Fletcher, and I'm a family practice doctor and work at the Student Health Center at the University of Montana and provide medical advice for working in It's a Small World. My daughter came in Vermont and renting um, from a person who was instructor on the Cycle of the Rockies. I know for years prior, and I think so. I think in Burlington, Vermont, so I think they're small intersecting so they can make it here. No, okay. So, yeah, so. <laughs> so. I'm Mike Kilbert and uh, Austin. I'm Catherine, Austin's mom. Uh, I'm Matt Frank. I uh, helped coordinate uh, the course this year after co leading with Ben last year. Um, I just love the course and excited to still be part of it. And, um, helped to uh, drive these guys back this morning. It was great hearing about uh, their adventure and excited to hear. More during the presentation. More little person. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is my uh, nearly 11 month old son, Everett, who is going to make noises. <laughs> <laughs> and someday you'll have a working course, too. Yeah, yeah. I think we already have some possible I'm Austin Gilbert. Uh, I'm going to be a sophomore at the University of Montana I'm from Missoula. And I'm studying physics. I'm Anna. Um, I go to UW Madison from born and raised in Wisconsin. Uh, I study environmental studies, community nonprofit leadership, and Spanish language. I'm Corey. I'm a student at the UM as well. I uh, study philosophy and Chinese. Yeah, maybe I'll come in where <laughs> people, people tuning in uh, can see us. Uh, I'm, I'm Ben Johnson. I'm uh, one of the instructors on the, on the course. 
And I am Caitlin Marine, and I am the other instructor on the course. Um, just kind of um, on behalf of work, we would like to thank you, you all for being here, um, as well as the people who are, who are tuning in today. Uh, we don't know how many of them are, there are right, right <laughs> yet, but uh, thank you for gracing us with your presence. And, uh, and uh, we invited a lot of our speakers uh, that we met with along the way to, to, um, to tune in today. So. Just uh, an extended thanks to uh, to all the uh, all the other people that you will hear a lot more about um, from from these uh, from these guys uh, for for kind of making uh, making this course possible. I believe you all are going to introduce our route a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So first, I guess I wanted to say for the people watching on the um, Google Hangouts, it'll be a little bit difficult to see the pictures, or slash really impossible to see the pictures on the TV. <laughs> um, if you have any questions about pictures, you can email us and we can always send you like a slideshow or other pictures. Um, also, I'm going to point to a map on the wall over there, and I don't know if you're going to rotate yeah, the camera. camera. Okay, so we're going to try to rotate the camera, so hopefully you can um, see the map. So, you guys have already been introduced to the course, Recycle Rockies 2015. Uh, we just finished this over 700 mile route across most of Montana. I'm just going to give a super brief overview of the route we did, and then we're all going to take turns talking about like different parts of it that interested us. We drove, we got driven to Billings, and we started there. We went north to Roundup. From there, we went west. Um, all the way until like White Sulphur, we started going south a little bit. We ended up in Townsend on the south of Canyon Prairie Lake and then we went up to Helena. That was our halfway point, um, both mileage wise and like it was two weeks into the course, so that worked out really well. We had a little break in Helena. From there we went um, up north again, uh, snaking a little bit through Augusta, Shoto, Dupuyer, all the way up to East Glacier. And then we went along the south side of Glacier Park to West Glacier, and that's where we finished, and that's where we got picked up today and brought back. So that's just a really brief preview of our trip, over 700 miles, and then we're going to kind of get into the nitty gritty details that you guys all want to know. Turn the camera back. Yep. Also, we're going to start. Yeah, so um, when we started out in Billings, um, we were actually staying on a ranch uh, just a little bit south of town. Um, and on the first day, um, the first speaker we met with was you know, Dave Hilo, and uh, he's a local physician in the buildings, uh, but he's also got a huge passion for wind energy, uh, and he's been funding a lot of uh, smaller scale projects in Montana. Um, so he talked to us a lot about uh, sort of the difficulties of dealing with the utility companies uh, and sort of establishing those uh, projects. Um, kind of an interesting speaker for the first day, you know, we joked a lot um, for a while about like how complicated he made everything, and just, you know, we really didn't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> you just like, it, it was literally all over the map, you know, it's like the science of the shape of the turbine blade, and like World War One politics, and like, <laughs> fertilizers, and world famines, and like, and it's, it's all connected. And we've, Found out later on, um, you know, the more we learn about things, that like all of these issues really are that big. Uh, you can't really separate things um, cleanly, like uh, I think we sometimes want to. Um, so the next day, we also met with some people at Northwestern Energy, which was very interesting. They gave us um, a good, solid like background in the history of energy production in Montana um, and sort of the difficulties with deregulation and some of the problems that created um, for Montanans and ratepayers, um, and then the like, reinstitution of regulation in 2007, I think it was. Um, and then it was also interesting they talked a lot about like their own portfolio of um, you know the what percentage is renewable and like hydropower and coal. Um, and that same day, we met with um, Alexis Bonagowski, whose ranch we were staying on. Um, and she um, 
had been the victim of the Exxon oil spill in the Yellowstone River a few years back. Um, and so she took us on a tour of her property and showed us, you know, there's still oil rings and some of the trees. Um, there's a lot of um, kind of dead fields that she's having difficulty uh, growing new crops on. Um, and then she's also an activist uh, fighting like the Otter Creek coal mine um, and trying to organize sort of grassroots movements um, to prevent further environmental destruction in order for uh, us to use fossil fuels in Montana. Um, so, you know, we spent a couple days in Billings and the next step we um, rode 20 miles north and stayed on a rancher's land named Steve Charter. And he was pursuing a PhD in everything, we decided. <laughs> um, you know, his main concern, I think, and kind of why we were originally going to him to talk about energy production is that he's nearby the Signal Peak coal mine, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so a lot of his cattle grazing lands are above the mine. It's an underground mine. Uh, so he had some concerns about that. Uh, and then he's also researching like carbon sequestration in the soil and like um, trying to bring back life to like desertifying uh, prairies um, so that farmers and ranchers can produce more and less land. Um, so he yeah knows a lot about a lot of things kind of overwhelming. Uh, he had a really cool house too, it's all passive solar. Um, really interesting guy. We got to feed baby cows when we were there. Yeah, that's the, 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 the pictures on there. They're really truly. Um, <laughs> also, just, just sort of a fun story. Um, our first like weather event was while we were staying at Steve's. Yeah. And uh, we had three tents, two people in each. And uh, Corey and I were sharing the tent. So there's a big rainstorm that comes through one night and like, a lot of thunder and stuff. And uh, Ben and Caitlin came over to our tent. And we're like, are you guys doing okay? Like, are you getting wet? And we got soaked in our tent. Corey and I were like, no, we're doing all right right now. Like, hopefully it holds up. Um, so we went back to bed. And uh, when we woke up in the morning, we put our heads out. We were the only tent <laughs> still there. <laughs> and, um, everyone else had fled to the um, garage <laughs> breakfast area. The Wendy's. <laughs> Um, so we spent a couple days at Steve's, um, and then we rode like another 20 miles to the Signal Peak coal mine in the Bull Mountains. Um, and it's the only underground coal mine in Montana, uh, and it's pretty big. They just got an expansion from the new coal lease recently. Um, and a lot of like Steve's and other ranchers' concerns with that are that uh, there was no new environmental impact statement created um, for those new seams of coal to be mined. Um, and they used like an outdated impact statement um, in order to justify um, you know, mining that coal. Um, so there's a lot of concerns uh, about subsidence. Um, the long wall technique, they call it when they're mining. Um, basically allows the roof to collapse behind them as they work through the seam. Uh, and that can cause a lot of like cracks in the surface. Um, I think the deepest they're working is only 600 feet below the surface. Um, so you know you notice the impacts when they're taking out that coal. Um, and the biggest concern there is um, the aquifer in the Bull Mountains, because all of the ranchers uh, depend on that for their operations. And if that were to be damaged uh, some way, it's kind of irreparable. That's a coal mine. <laughs> yeah. Massive tracks. Um, so, yeah, that's, you know, even just ignoring like concerns about climate change, um, it's, you know, a threat to the local economy that's been there for generations. Um, and, you know, the, the mine is required to claim and like repair the damage that they do to the environment. A lot of the times that's just um, topography though. Uh, you know, they'll fill cracks with concrete and cover it up with dirt. 
So water flow is different, uh, plant life is not going to be the same. Um, and unfortunately, nobody has really looked at that before approving further mining. Um, that said, you know, the mine is also very important for the Montana economy. 40% uh, of our electricity uh, comes from coal. Um, and, and yeah, so 40% of Northwestern's energy comes from coal, and it's uh, really consistent, you know, it kind of provides like the base load. Um, and then you can use other technologies to account for like higher demands. Um, but you know, there's local concerns uh, about that. Um, and then also, it's interesting, you know, when you're burning all this coal for electricity, there's uh, a lot of uh, inefficiencies in like transmission to the actual consumers. Uh, and a lot of the readings we read actually pointed out that it's more efficient to like take a chunk of coal. And burn it to toast a piece of bread than it is to actually use a toaster. Um, so I just thought I'd leave you guys with that <laughs> image. So um, that paints a kind of a, a bleak picture, I guess, um, for how we're going to get our energy and what should we do. Um, so from there, we, we moved on from our focus on uh, how the current energy situation is in Montana and how energy is currently made. We focus a lot on coal in the first week. And then um, we moved on to renewables to focus on where the movement is going, where it started, and what we can do to, if, to explore moving away from fossil fuels. So from um, Signal Peak, we went up to Roundup. Um, and there we stayed at a campground. Um, we were met with some really great hospitality there. We got to eat a lot of hamburgers and hot dogs that the local, uh, the local Knights of Columbus hosted us for a night um, and told us stories about uh, the 2011 flood um, that actually kept this course. Uh, <laughs> It uh, kind of trapped this course in 2011, and they were also very hosp um, hospitable then, too, so they hosted them for an extra uh, night. So they told us all those stories, and it was really cool to hear that little bit of history. Um, we also um, met with two founders of an organization called AERO, A-E-R-O. It stands for Alternative Energy Resource Organization, and um, their names were Elizabeth and Wilbur Wood. They spoke with us about how the movement towards renewables sort of started, at least in Montana, um, in 1974. I think they had a they founded their organization and they had a fair called the New Western Energy, right? Yeah, the New Western Energy Show, um, and that was to showcase the ways that um, energy could be made using wind, solar, geothermal. And not just energy, also like hot water, heating, um, passive solar structures. So that was really neat to see the history of that. And they also spoke with us about how it used to be seen as a sort of alternative thing. It was cute to try and be off the grid or go alternative. And they said that now it seems that it's, it's becoming a lot more um, fast paced and more people are adopting it. And so it's becoming like a, re a reality for a lot of people to be able to use solar, to be able to use wind, um, passive energy, passive solar structures. So they said that um, now it's becoming more difficult, that it's a lot of times you run into issues with utility companies um, when you want to add solar to your house. Um, it becomes really expensive. So they were going through those issues with us, which was really interesting that people are making progress and they really want to make progress, but there are still some issues um, with that. Um, then from Roundup, we moved to Rygate, um, where we stayed with a woman named Jean Wallace. She is also a small scale, she's focused on small scale energy. She had a small wind turbine and uh, solar panels as well. She also lived in a passive solar designed house um, that she and her late husband actually designed themselves because there wasn't there weren't any architects that could um, help them really design it they didn't 
know how to work with passive solar structures back then. So we thought that was really interesting that um, the message she sent us was that when you can't, when there's no way to do something, you have to make your own way and you have to like kind of invent it. And that's what a lot of the alternative energy movement has been is learning how to do something yourself and kind of making a path for other people because there's a lot of things that haven't been done before being done for the first time. And we met a lot of people that were the first ones to do something and that was really, really interesting. I also had the best enchiladas of my life at Jean's house. <laughs> um, it was amazing. We got to stay inside her house. Um, her, her, she had an extra two bedrooms. Um, she cooked us enchiladas. We also made some salads and cornbread. It was super good. Um, and we had an amazing breakfast there too. So it was really nice to take a little bit of a break um, and feel at home again, I guess, not in a tent. So that was a really nice break, at least for me. Ben slept out on the first, porch. First opportunity so. for laundry. Yeah, we did a little bit of laundry. That was really nice. One load combined with all of us. You know what? One sock. Yeah. <laughs> but it was something which was really, really nice. Um, she also kind of impacted me in her message that we, in order to make lasting change, we have to change attitudes, and that's really hard to do when you're forcing people to change. So instead, she encouraged us to. Um, like get beliefs together, like find a common ground with people in order to make change that, so that you're not like forcing something. Um, and I thought that was a really good message in what we're going to go on and share in our lives that just because we believe something um, and others don't doesn't make it right or wrong, but we have to find common ground and to be able to make change. So I thought that was a really interesting message that she sent us. Um, going from small scale, we kind of moved, um, we saw a large scale for a day. We went to the Judith Gap Wind Farm um, on our way to Harlowtown, right? Okay, just making sure. I'm not from Montana, so I don't know where anything is. Um, so, uh, yeah, Judith Gap is a huge commercial scale wind farm. Um, we got to tour it, and we actually got to go inside the base of a turbine and learn about how much energy is produced. Um, and it's not, so there are also issues with large scale, um, just like there are issues with small scale. A lot of issues with small scale have to do with maintenance and hooking up with the grid. And then issues with large scale wind production, at least, um, is that the wind isn't always blowing in a certain spot. So when the wind isn't blowing, they're producing <coughs> nothing. Um, and the wind, when the wind is blowing a lot, of course, they're producing at capacity. So. Um, we think a possible solution, well it's not just we think, it's a, a solution to that is to have more scattered, smaller wind farms throughout the state so that when the wind isn't blowing here, it's blowing somewhere else and it's still producing that power so that there's a more balanced load because that's a kind of a message we've been getting is that wind is unpredictable, it's stochastic, you can't tell when it's going to blow, but I think when, um, when the wind turbines are scattered kind of all over, it makes it a lot better. Montana like the number one or two potential for wind energy in the country. There's a lot of wind here. So we think that'd be really cool to kind of be developed a lot more. Um, we also saw kind of a medium small scale wind um, set up in, at the Martinsdale Hutterite Colony. We visited there for just, um, just a few hours and talked to uh, Peter Whip there. And he talked about um, issues like maintaining the wind turbines and being hooked up to the grid, kind of repeating a lot of the messages that we've heard. Um, but even though it can be difficult, he said he really likes it, and he um, they continue to use the wind turbines that, like their oldest wind turbines, they can repair themselves and they keep using them and keep working. So um, that was also like really interesting to see a, a really strong work ethic in that, and that just keep pushing forward and keep trying. Um, that night we stayed at one of our what we most of us agreed was our favorite campsite on the trip. Um, it's interesting because there's a few pictures of it with beautiful sunsets, but it's interesting there was no, there wasn't even a bathroom or any um, like services there. It was just a campsite on a lake off the road, and that was really nice to be away from things for a while. So it, as nice as it was to be in a house, it was also really nice to just um, relax on the side of a lake and be able to feel away from everything for a while. Um, moving on from there, we went to White Sulphur Springs and stayed at Hot Springs where we got to swim and shower. 
um, and kind of wash our clothes off a little bit in the in the showers as well. So that was it was really fun to soak um, and learn about how they heat their hotel and their pools with geothermally heated water. Um, that was really interesting because it's he also has solar and wind, which he uses for energy, which they use for energy, um, but. The water was, I think, the most interesting part for me is that you're basically, you take it out of the ground, you run it through some pipes, and they put it out, like, right right where it would have gone anyways. So I think that's a really interesting example of a minimal impact on the ecosystem using uh, geothermally heated water to heat in entire buildings. Um, also, speaking of heating, the next day we went to Townsend Schools, and we saw they have a biomass um, burning heater or boiler for to heat their schools as well as wind project and solar project um, which I thought was super important to educate kids about renewable energy and the possibilities and I think that's a really great example I wish there were more grants because they got it because of a grant so I wish there were more grants for schools and kids to learn um, about where our energy comes from and what we can do uh, to move towards renewable energy um, going on from there, we started to talk policy. We got into Helena. Um, we met with some some people who are really affecting the policies in Montana. We met with the Montana Environmental Information Center. We met with the Department of Environmental Quality. A um, man named Van Jamison, who used to be the Energy State Director, State Director, Director of Energy in Montana. Um, so we started hearing a lot about policies and uh, diff like the difficulties and the solutions that are being made. Um, the fact that Montana actually has a really progressive environmental clause in their constitution, uh, which I thought was really interesting. So we started to talk about how to balance politics with the environment and climate change. And I think Corey's going to start to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so we had our layover in Helena, which was a nice break after two weeks of being on your bike like almost every single day. Um, got a chance to kind of just hang out, not ride. Um, Helena had their like a live at five things. We all, all uh, kind of joined that and had fun. Um, so yeah, like Anna said, we met with MEIC um, and they kind of told us just all the different areas that they're involved in activism. Uh, whether it's with organization, with doing research projects to kind of lay out the economics of uh, fossil fuels as well as renewables in the state. Um, and then they also do quite a bit of uh, lawsuits, um, which is unfortunately some of the only ways that you can get people to follow the laws. Um, and then we met with the DEQ, uh, and that was real cool because right now it's a pretty big time for energy in the nation in general. Um, we have the Clean Power Plan that's about to be enacted, uh, and all the states received a draft last year, uh, and they're also given like a target number to hit uh, as far as reductions in CO2 emissions. Um, so we kind of sat down with them and talked about their, their different ways that they plan to, uh, to meet those reductions. Um, like Anna said, with wind, we're really fortunate, like we have a, a big option for renewables, um, but as Austin was talking about, coal is pretty pretty big for the economy here, so it's a really big toss-up. They're kind of walking a little thin line there. Um, and then meeting with Van, he was pessimistic, to say the least. Um, you know, I guess you spend enough time in one industry, like, trying to make a big change, and you don't see much result from that, uh, and it's pretty easy to say, like, nothing can happen. But he, he made a really, like, many good points of the technological disadvantages uh, that we have, we don't work together as states for energy. Uh, so kind of his, his idea or his uh, goal or the only way that it could work together in, in, his, uh, in his view would be uh, a plan that works between states, which is something that the DEQ is looking at. Uh, they're given the option in the Clean Power Plan to kind of address uh, their requirements and reduction together. Um, so from there, we, we headed out of Helena, we rode to Wolf Creek, um, which has Walter Dam on it, uh, and that was a really nice ride. I know for Anna, that was her favorite ride. It's all that. Yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the, that's uh, the only day I could keep up. Yeah. <laughs> and we, uh, yeah, it was all downhill. We didn't really face much wind. Um, like, 
we have the biggest wind potential in Montana. So when you're biking <laughs> against the direction of the wind, you usually have a head headwind almost every day. Um, and unfortunately, we missed the director of the dam. I'm not sure if the director was his title, but he worked at the dam, so we didn't get to learn a lot uh, about really the function. Um, but I will I'll get into uh, hydro and some of some of the benefits and as well as the issues with it uh, in a little bit. Um, and so from there, we rode uh, up to Augusta. Uh, we stayed at a man named Hal's house. Fortunately, he was out of town too. So <laughs> the, the second portion of our of our course, we didn't really line up with speaker dates, which sometimes happens when, when you're on your bike, you're pretty limited to like when you can show up places, um, how quick you can get there. But his family hosted us and they're very nice. Um, mosquitoes weren't so nice, but it, it was a good time. Uh, and from there, we rode up uh, to Shoto, where we stayed for a few days. Um, we we met with uh, Dan and Harold, and they were uh, energy developers in the area. Uh, pretty much what they do is connect. Uh, there's a lot of oil um, along the Rocky Mountain front, so they, they connect people uh, that are looking to, to either explore or drill for this oil with the landowners or the mineral, mineral rights owners uh, that, that are holding it currently. Um, and I'm sure, as most of you know, there's like a lot of there is a lot of issues with fracking, uh, as far as the environment goes. Oil business in general doesn't really have a good reputation. So they're kind of doing everything they can to develop this for the economy and for the people there, and, and get get funding for schools and tax revenue and other things like that without the negative impacts that that come along with with fracking. Um, unfortunately, when you're pulling a lot out of the ground, it's going to get burnt somewhere. Uh, so the, the carbon emissions are something that you really just uh, you can't negate. So we kind of see different, have a different viewpoint than they do, but uh, they're real good at giving us their opinion. And then they're also developing some wind energy or attempting to develop some wind energy in Teton County there. So we talked a bit with them uh, just about their opinions. And even though most people there are really not, a, not for wind, uh, even though it gives a lot of, or pretend, could give potential revenue to the uh, to the county, there they were pretty uh, for it at least for these specific projects. So it's kind of cool to see somebody's, you know, they're oil developers, but at the same time they're standing there saying, yeah, like we'll stand up for this wind project. We think it should happen. Um, and from Shoto, we read to we rode to Depoyer. Personally, that was the worst ride for me. Um, I, I don't know if Austin agrees, but I know Ann and I thought that was the worst ride. It was uh, 40 uphill. miles or something like that. But it, was, it wasn't the distance. Yeah, it was uphill into like a 25-mile headwind. Oh, yeah. Like I was in my lowest gear going downhill, pedaling as hard as I could, and still not moving very fast. It was hot, too. Yeah, and it was a hot day as well. Ben ran out of water, so I had to some water. It was just all around, like, as soon as we got to the campsite there, we all pulled out our mattress pads and took a nice long nap, um, which was, I, I think, very deserved. Um, so from Depoyer, we moved to East Glacier, um, and that was a pretty cool area. Uh, it, it's really beautiful once you start to get back into the mountains from the plains. Um, it was a nice ride. Uh, we spent a few days in East Glacier, and then then moved around the south end of the park uh, on Highway 2, I believe, which was by far the busiest uh, road that we were on. Plus, we had 4th of July traffic. Yeah. Like, and I think it was our longest ride, 62 miles, yeah. our longest loaded ride. So uh, it was a tough one. Ann and I did not think we were going to make it. Um, <laughs> But we did, <laughs> and we got to swim in the Flathead River, which was awesome. Like, we were pretty much biking along the river the whole time, and finally got it. Like, we're just looking at people raft by us, <laughs> <laughs> and by the time we got into West Glacier, we like loaded up on lunch supplies and hit the river and hung out for a while. So it was real good. We how, many, it. how many times did I ask you during that day? Like, how many the water? Yeah, it's just like, literally like, every time we yeah. stop, I'm just like, dude. <laughs> it's over there. <laughs> Come up to he's just rested, like staring out. <laughs> yeah, we were all real happy to be able to jump in. Um, and so, kind of throughout this whole time, 
uh, we moved on, on the second half of the trip. We really moved from discussing the uh, energy options and and solutions that are available into Mon in Montana over to more climate change in general. Um, and climate change is a huge issue, um, but I kind of like to just give like a quick, uh, I guess, summary of. Of, of what we learned and how it relates to the energy um, and just a few of the points that I found most interesting um, in doing studies on climate change in the past, things that I hadn't really uh, come across before or uh, maybe didn't pay as much attention to. So just kind of as a, as a, a basis, two degrees is like two degrees Celsius in warming is where, where scientists agree that we need to, to be limited to. Um, and we've already reached about 0.8 degrees Celsius. So, and, and that's kind of like global average temperature. Uh, so they measure the, the temperature at a lot of different locations throughout the year to come up with that data. Um, some scientists say that even two degrees isn't enough. The ocean already has become a third more acidic than it was before they started taking these type of measurements. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a lenient goal in some people's eyes. Um, but at the same time, it's a, a difficult goal to obtain. Uh, the reason for that being, it, if we really want to limit to that goal, we were kind of allotted uh, like a carbon allowance, if you will. Uh, the amount of carbon that scientists predict we can, can emit uh, through the different forms of fossil fuels, uh, and that's 565 gigatons. It, it sounds like a massive amount, um, but when you compare it, we use each year globally about 31 gigatons, um, and that's increasing. So that, that limit will uh, pretty much be eaten up in about 15 years' time, um, which is, when you really think about it, it's like if we continue to produce at the rate we do without replacing uh, with newer technologies, newer lifestyles, and things like that, we're, we're really reaching our limit pretty quick. Um, and kind of the big controversy, but with both those numbers, uh, is the amount of carbon that's in the ground that we know of. As far as fossil fuels go, if we were to burn everything in proven reserves, we would burn up about uh, or admit 200 and almost almost 3,000 uh, gigatons. So that's more than five times the amount that, that scientists have really allotted to us. Um, so I, I just found that as like an amazing stat. Like when you just look at those three numbers, it really gives you the idea like change needs to happen and it's no longer this far off. Uh, issue is something that's happening to us right now, and the sci scientists really have kind of a grasp on what our limit is. Um, and and the, the problem is, uh, with that much carbon in the ground, like I said, they're proven reserves, so those, those are taken into account economically for private corporations. When they're traded in stock markets, they're held as assets, they can lend against them, uh, and then for uh, governments, because a lot of the oil is owned by governments, so those governments can uh, kind of do the same thing. They can borrow against their their counted into their national budgets and things like that. So it's going to it is extremely difficult to convince all of these people that hold rights to these uh, natural resources and fossil fuels that the economic trade off that what they're going to lose in in dollars is really going to be worth it. Um, and kind of the way that we can that we've been addressing this, like Anna's been talking about renewables, uh, that's along the adaptation line, so there's kind of adaptation and mitigation. Um, and as much as we see like Energy Star appliances, conserved turn off lights, CFL light bulbs, uh, really those things haven't made any impact in our carbon emission. It, it's kind of like sad to realize that, but there needs to be a lot more change than, than what's happened because we don't we don't see in the annual emissions of carbon we haven't really seen the effort that's that we've made globally so far has had almost no impact um, which is kind of scary when you start to think about it um, and kind of one of the things that we talked about throughout this whole class uh, was this idea of Jevons paradox which is kind of the explanation of why these efficiency measures haven't haven't made a difference because as things become more efficient, they become less expensive, um, and that kind of fuels use in other areas. So though it's less, ex you know, your energy bill on a personal level is less expensive, you save the money, you might use that money to go on vacation. The carbon that you burn going on that vacation replaces pretty much all the money that you saved, um, or the, 
the carbon that you save from emitting. Um, so I think we really need to think in terms of conservation uh, as opposed to efficiency. So our total use, not how efficiently we use, I think that'll make a big difference if we start to set goals in conservation versus efficiency. Um, and then renewables are, are a pretty big option. We're definitely going to have to have to um, adopt a lot of renewables. Um, and they're growing quickly, becoming a lot cheaper. In the last decade, a fifth of all energy development was in renewables. So it is a viable option. Um, but as Anna pointed out, there's issues with it, uh, both with utility companies, with the economics of it. Um, but hopefully it will become easier. But I think we're going to need some trans transition, some technologies to transition us into a kind of total renewable. Right now, that's natural gas, which has a lot of uh, implications to the environment as well as is still a fossil fuel that's carbon emitting. Um, so I think I think the takeaway that I kind of got from the what we've done to adapt so far uh, hasn't been a lot, and there there really needs to be almost a social shift of the way we think about uh, our carbon consumption, our fossil fuel consumption, the way it really fuel, uh, fuels our lifestyle, allows us to live with the amount of entities that we have. Um, and then the other way to kind of uh, keep us from reading, reaching this two degree limit or keep us under our 565 gigaton uh, allotment of carbon uh, is mitigation technologies. So that is, as opposed to like trying to reduce the total carbon we emit, this is technologies to either sequester carbon from the air, so take it out of the air and potentially put it to the ground, or to reflect the sunlight. Um, and I think there's a lot of issues with these technologies. As far as like solar reflection goes, it's extremely expensive. We have no way of knowing if we can scale it up. There really hasn't been a lot of experimentation done on that. Um, and then I personally, I feel the biggest issue is if we really develop, like it's good to have these as a safety plan, but if we develop these issues or develop these technologies, people, the general public might look at it and corporations might look at it as, look, there's the science. It can save us from the effects of global warming. Why do we need to worry about our personal consumption? Um, and that's pretty much the exact opposite mindset that I feel is, is the most important. Um, and then, like I said, there's carbon capture techniques. There's kind of the technological side, uh, which they have developed ways to capture carbon both directly out of the air and from, uh, from carbon emitting sources like fossil fuel, uh, or sorry, carbon fueled power plants. Um, and again, you know, this is a little, little less risky, but the technology isn't there to scale it up. And we don't really know how to sequester carbon into the ground, at least when we collect it through technologies. Um, so in my opinion, the most uh, efficient or effective, realistic uh, future technology for this type of carbon sequestration is something that Austin mentioned earlier uh, that we learned primarily about from Steve Charter. Uh, and it's basically referred to as carbon farming. The plants use carbon put it into the ground through their roots. Um, and this sort of uh, process has both economical benefits for the farmers. Uh, you can raise a lot more head of cattle or sheep on smaller plots of land. Um, it also uh, really increases soil health. It prevents desertification, um, which is a huge issue, especially in developing nations. Um, and as we use our traditional farming methods and agricultural methods, we till and just allow more carbon into the ground. So if we can kind of instill these ideals or practices uh, as we move forward, I think there's real hope. And just to kind of start with some numbers, just to leave you with a number, um, some of the scientists doing this type of, of carbon farming predict that if 10% of the world's uh, farmland was used for carbon farming, they think that they can, I'm not sure what the time period is, but they can return uh, the CO2 levels in the air back to pre-industrial times. So, I mean, that that seems to me like the most hopeful uh, and realistic possibility uh, to, to kind of keep us at, at that limit and make sure we don't get above two degrees.
kind of like a lot to throw at everybody um, about what we've done, but that covered, I guess, like the main parts and what was interesting to most of us. Do, does anyone have any questions right now, like about photos or anything we talked about? Or? Well, I'm curious, you said 40% in Montana now. Yeah. From yeah. Northwestern. Yeah, that's Northwestern's. No, like the five co-ops and stuff. Oh, I see all the yeah. co-ops. Yeah, so it varies. How much higher? It's about fifty percent um, for Northwestern because they just bought. Um, they acquired almost all the dams from PPL Montana. So they don't. They're renewable portfolio is is really fat, but really it's it's all due to hydro. They don't have as much wind or they don't have any soil. And uh, another interesting thing too that Northwestern brought up when we were talking with them is that uh, you know hydro is like the most uh, researched and developed of the like renewable um, energy options. At the same time, it's kind of on its last breath. Um, there's you know a lot of concerns with like river health um, and. Uh, you know, they're just a lot more older. Um, can't build more dams. Yeah, yeah, you can't build there's more. There's no more way as our, yeah, as our energy needs increase, there's like pretty much it's impossible for as far as like environmental impacts for any new dam projects to get through. It just doesn't seem and then, Yeah, and like looking super long term you now with these effects of climate change starting to set in, um, you know, we're seeing a lot more droughts and stuff. And if you're depending on the dams, for all the power and then you have drought. Yeah. So you and said that our switching on the lights, driving electric cars, <laughs> is not making the impact mm -hmm. that, right? So what is it that we, I guess, as individuals can do to start making an impact? Wow, one of the messages that we received pretty clearly in, when we were in Helena talking with policymakers and people that are making change is that um, personal change, like choosing to drive a more efficient car or choosing to use less water in your shower or whatever, um, that is like really good for personal satisfaction, but it doesn't always, it doesn't equal social change and it doesn't equal political change. So one of the most important things we can do is to um, speak out, uh, make sure our, that our policymakers and lawmakers know that we want to move towards um, a cleaner energy future um, and that we're really like impacting the places where it matters the most, where the laws are being made. And that's generally where um, most of the change comes about is when a law is passed or a policy is made, um, curbing emissions or requiring certain standards that um, bigger changes made. As well as like large scale social change is really important too. Whole attitude, social shift. Yeah, yeah. I think it says much about like how you voice your opinion, both to politicians as well as like the people around you, and how educated you make yourself about the issue. Like you can just assume that knowing that you need to pollute less is like good for the environment, or you could be like interested and given like time into researching either local or national issues that your voice can make a difference on. I think that's probably like that's it. Yeah, that's the best yeah. way to do it. You don't want to give up hard one good habits. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you mentioned uh, ocean being more acidic. Mm -hmm. Is that a coal burning? Um so the the ocean is actually absorbing a lot. It's a very complicated process and Caitlin explained to it. It it has a lot to do with like the way the ocean currents exist, the, the ocean's ex like, it's becoming warmer and it's absorbing a lot of the carbon. So a lot of the carbon that we emit doesn't, isn't actually like, doesn't stay in the atmosphere necessarily. It's sequestered into the ocean. Um, and so temperature as well as uh, salinity like affects the acidic levels. I'm like, I'm not a scientist, so I can't, it's, <laughs> like, it's, it's a whole host of effects though. So. <laughs> so um I guess we were thinking we were gonna open with um 
a little poem, but I, we didn't do that. So we're going to close <laughs> with a little a little poem. Um, our instructor, Caitlin, wrote a really nice rhyming recap of our entire trip. So we wanted to just leave you with that um, as an overall, like, I guess, review of our whole trip. You want to share that again? Missoula was where our group had its start. We sorted through gear at the edge of the park. In Billings, we stayed at Alexis's place. Four years ago, there was oil in that space. She and Mike have goats, horses, and hounds. They fight to keep Otter free coal in the ground. We also spoke to the state's largest utility, which recently closed the Correct Coal facility. Next stop was a ranch to learn about a mine. To talk coal in Montana, we walk a very fine line. We toured Signal Peak Mine on day six, saw train loading towers, belts, and the coal dust rates. Colorful characters came to the Roundup campground. After dinner with Pat, we brought back seven pounds. A snack with Uncle John hit the spot, narrow shouldered rolling hills of some headwinds we fought. In Harleton, we showered, swam, and washed clothes. That night came a storm that left three rainbows. We had mighty winds on the way back from Judith Gap. Checkerboard was the next stop on the map. Peter talked about community energy successes. By now, our legs start to feel cool climbing stresses. A great sunset and a campfire a lake, then down from the mountains to the hot springs to bake. We met Jean, the spring's owner, who showed us around, right to where hot water comes out of the ground. The next day we climbed over a large hill, Meeting other touring cyclists was quite a thrill. Andrea showed us the biomass heater at Townsend. Camp was quiet until a visitor came around the bend. <laughs> Traveling to Helena, we met cyclists crossing the west. Staying with Sven and Laura was simply the best. There was class recess meeting at MEIC. Then Jameson told us how wind can get dicey. Breakfast for dinner was quite a feast. The next day, gravel miles were downhill at least. We got up early to beat the heat, but seven miles took a, soul, took a toll on our seats. We arrived in Augusta for a parade down Main Street, a good study break where we picked up some sweets. Rolling hills and light winds made for a good ride. Visiting with Harold, we heard the pro-development side. Another day in Shoto gave us time to read. Unfortunately, there were mosquitoes to feed. <laughs> we rode into a headwind through fields of hay, our average speed only eight miles an hour that day. <laughs> Camping in the foyer was a really nice spot. After lunch at the lake, a brief hailstorm we were caught. Riding Hartview Road was a very little feat, then Ice Cream and East Glacier was a perfect treat. At Two Medicine Lake, we had a class. The next day, Crested Mariah's Pass. Sending to West Glacier to spend a few days, we had heat waves and rain, but remained on the base. Going to the Sun Road was a beautiful ride, nothing like sunset on the Continental Divide. We traveled together in touring style through city and country, mile by mile. Some were easier than others, but all have a place for our study of energy and the climate change case. Now students present their learnings live, and will likely think twice before taking a drive. <laughs> so yeah, I think coming from both and I, like, we had a really wonderful time and the students were super engaged, did a great job, um, as you can see, like, working really hard throughout the course, both physically and intellectually, which is a lot of the goal of what we're trying to get out of this course is like, experiencing the education as well as kind of reading about it. So they did they did rack up some pages as well as miles. It was like total reading count was what, 550, something like that? Well, 350 in the reader plus a novel and then some online. <laughs> so yeah, they did, they, they did, they did a lot of work. They deserve a, deserve a little rest of this one. But, yeah. What was the total present? Um, 743, I think. It would take a few because some of us, like Caitlin and Ben, bike to a grocery store that we didn't go to. And, <laughs> <laughs> there's a little bit, but I'll say.
Definitely over, over 700. Over 700. Yeah. 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 Austin did a couple of those twice. Yeah, yeah. Austin. Yeah. <laughs> we went back to check if we were okay. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that we attract the, the best and the brightest students, and I think uh, your presentation today really demonstrated that. And we also, I think, attract the best instructors and uh, really qualified folks to teach for us. We have to say it with parents, you know, safety is our first priority. So we're also uh, really grateful that after 700 miles, uh, everyone arrived back here without yeah. an incident um, and learned a tremendous amount. And I think one of the greatest things that I find about working for uh, Murphy is the community that develops. Um, you know, Molly talked about being a uh, former student and now an instructor. And, um, you all now become part of something much larger. We have alumni who go on to instruct for us, who go on to uh, be real leaders uh, in our community on a variety of issues. Uh, we'd love to stay in touch with um, the thousands of students who've gone through our, our programs, and so we hope that will be the same for you all. And to the family members who are here, thank you for supporting you. Uh, our goal is to provide the, the most uh, unique and academically rigorous uh, college experience for them. And <laughs> so, thank you. Enjoy the snacks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>